the organizing committee that keeps doing their wonderful job for seven years and many more to come. So, um, I'm Alexis Zavras. I'm doing open source compliance at a large American company called Hello. Maybe. Okay, so our talk is about uh, outsourcing our wonderful legal obligations, which is a nice, very nice, uh, catchy title for the uh, uh, big companies. Um, so, Intel, at Intel we deliver a lot of software. We are mainly a hardware company, as you probably know. Uh, uh, that makes my job much easier because the company mentality is that uh, software is just an enable for us to sell more hardware. So, it's pretty uh, the default to make software open source. And we deliver a lot of software. Uh, and our software is always a combination of our own and open source software, right? And as is typical today, uh, a typical software product is around 80% software that you get from other sources and 20% the software that you write yourself. If you're writing much more than that, you know, you don't have a competitive advantage, something like that. So, um, um, many software components that we use have a legal source code distribution requirement. I'm sure you've heard that before. And uh, in our case, we also want to deliver sources for other pieces of software that may not have this obligation requirement, but we still want to deliver the source. Right. So uh, this is a reminder for <laughs> the legal requirement. This is copied from GPL v2, that when you deliver an executable, you know, you have to deliver the complete corresponding source code. Uh, as it exactly says, complete source code, it means all the source code for all the module it contains, plus any associated interface definition files, plus the script used to control compilation and installation of the executable. And this is a basic idea in copyleft licenses. This that you have to deliver the complete code of the software that you're delivering the executable for. Okay. The wording might change per license per license, right? Different terms may be used, but the idea is the same. Uh, so in GPLv2, it's called complete corresponding machine readable source code. And the verb that you have to uh, uh, fulfill is you have to accompany the executable with this thing. Uh, in GPLv3, the terms were changed to corresponding source and you have to convey it. Uh, in Mozilla version two, they're talking about source code form of the software, and you have to make it available. And the, the, this source code form has to be made available. It's a passive term, even. Uh, and uh, in EPLv2, uh, in Eclipse Public License, it's also source code, and uh, it also has to be made available. Right. So trying to fulfill these obligations, we were thinking of uh, how to uh, do this thing. In an ideal world or in, in a very German organized <laughs> company, I'm based in Germany, uh, so you will have a foolproof process that it's in place and everyone follows it strictly and you set it up once and everything works magically uh, for the rest of your life. Uh, this is not always the case. It's not happening in pra the practical consideration, especially if you're talking about a uh, very large company spanning the whole globe as we do, um, as we are. So people change roles uh, or they um, leave the company. Uh, reorganizations happen, pretty, yeah, much more than you <laughs> would think so of. And things get forgotten and you know, uh, people completely uh, uh, lose the uh, corporate history of different products and stuff like that. So you have to make sure that you always deliver the complete corresponding source code because the product, as you probably know, may have a very long life, much longer life than the original team that created the product. So uh, trying to build this 
in house, we started thinking of what are the different use cases, right? So when we have to deliver source code, what do we have to deliver? Uh, and there are a couple of uh, obvious uh, use cases. So uh, the first thing is we have to deliver the source code that we wrote ourselves. We have it in a software package, uh, tar archive, uh, and uh, uh, we have to deliver this thing. Um, a second use case is we have to deliver the uh, very well-known package, you know, like a GCC version, a specific version, uh, how we build it, and all this stuff. Right. The third case, uh, we have to deliver uh, the same well-known package on a specific revision level, right? So not one of the published releases, but we took one specific one uh, because it wasn't released as a release yet. We have a single commit. Anyway, we have a, a unique identifier for a specific version of an open source software which is out there. And the last uh, uh, bullet is a use case of a combination of this thing. So we took this well-known open source at a specific version, but we did some patches to that. And that's what we are using. And because we have to deliver the complete corresponding source code of the binary, uh, we have to deliver this source code. Right. So, and obviously there are a combination of that. Ideally, you can have a bundle because you might have more than one uh, packages there. Right. So these are the different use cases that we want to deliver source code from. Um, so, translating this into functional requirements, we need to provide our own software packages, right? Uh, the source code that we wrote and we have, right? Or we have uh, to refer to well-known free and open source components that are on the internet uh, with a release version or a specific uh, commit or uh, commit ID or something, a specific snap point, right? Snapshot. Um, and we want to uh, combine the two, right? Um, components with our own patches, with our own software, right? So the great idea that uh, came to us is, can we outsource this fulfillment process, right? So instead of us doing it, can we ask somebody else to do it for us, right? Uh, the, major legal question for this room is, is it compliant, right? Can we really outsource it without getting into trouble, right? And we had lots of discussions with John and all the FSF and <laughs> lots of other people and many of our lawyers. And so, for example, in GPL FAQ, there is this wonderful question, can I put the binaries in my internet server and put the source on a different internet site, right? So. Uh, there are two GPL online, uh, the G GPL FAQs online for version 3 and version 2. Uh, both of them, the reply is yes. So uh, one is that you have to make sure that the source remains available, right? Uh, but you can have it somewhere else, right? And the, uh, even in the older version for uh, version 2, uh, if you make arrangements to have it always there, uh, we think that it qualifies from the same place, right? So it doesn't have to be on the same server. Let's ask if somebody else can do it, right? So thinking of all the trouble that we're getting into uh, in order to fulfill this requirement, wouldn't it be great if we can find someone to fulfill this requirement? And we found Zach. hear me? Yes, it works. So that's someone here. He's not actually me, so I'm not going to host all the uh, corresponding source code tables of Intel on my personal website. But the idea is to use the Software Heritage Project as a place that can work with actors like Intel to host those, those complete and corresponding source code tables. So this talk is not about Software Heritage, so I will give you more pointers to learn no more about the project at the end of the talk, or you can check out our keynote here at FOSDEM last year describing the project in detail. I will just go through the basics of the project that are relevant for the use case we're working with.
We're working on with Intel. So Software Heritage is a project whose mission is to archive the entire body of free, soft, free and open source, source code software we can find on the internet. So we harvest forges, we harvest places where we know we can find source code, and we archive that. The mission, in, uh, in a nutshell, is collecting all that body of source code, preserving it in the very long term to avoid it get lost, and sharing it with everyone who needs to access the source code that we have archived. So we, have, uh, we are uh, uh, focused on a single mission of doing the archival part, so we, uh, but we are meant to serve different use cases. So there are some cultural heritage, heritage use cases, there are some industrial use cases like the one we're discussing here today. There are some scientific use cases like imagine offering researcher the ability to analyze all this code in a coherent way. And there are educational use cases. But the point is that we're only working on the foundation rather than try to uh, implement ourselves the solutions for all the different use cases. And to maximize the chances of succeeding, given the mission is, is fairly big, we're developing it in a completely transparent and open way. So all the code, the code we develop ourselves for the mission is free software, uh, generally copyleft. And we're also setting up this as a non-profit endeavor because we think it has more chances to remain for a very long term if it is a non-profit endeavor rather than a for-profit one. Uh, by default, so before this kind of adaptation for interesting industrial use case, what we do is that we are a crawler. Okay? So we have a bunch of places we know are meant to uh, distribute source code, like forges, or uh, software pa source code packages in distributions, or source code packages in language-specific package managers. And we crawl, so I won't go through the, the details of our architecture, but we're basically a crawler. We go in those places where we, we, we retrieve all the source code we can find, and we store it in a single data model where everything is deduplicated. So if we find the same file on multiple forges or multiple packages, we store it only once. Same thing for the commits, because we also store the entire development history of all the source code we can find. So this is our general architecture. And it's a real thing, so it's not just theory. So we already have assembled a very large and substantial archival source code. So we, our sources that we track um, day by day are GitHub and Debian for now, and we have also ingested in the archive the entire um, history of Google code and Gitorius at the time they shut down. And we're working on ingesting also Bitbucket and adding other sources of source code. This is something like more than 4 billion unique source code files, about 1 billion commits coming from more than 70 million origins, so Git repos or packages or that kind of stuff. Um, it's a pretty substantial archive if you see it as a graph, and we, we believe it's today the largest uh, archive of pu public source code that you can find on the internet. And of course it's growing daily because every day we recrawl those sources and find new stuff there to add to the archive. But this is the, the crawling part, the pool part. For satisfying the needs of uh, distributors of products that contain source code, you need some sort of push way of adding stuff to their archive. So the idea here is that now we have a service that we are opening up uh, as a prototype, which is a, a, a deposit service. So essentially, with people that are partners of the project, because we don't want to become you know, another mega upload or something that where people go to just store wallets. But so if we have an agreement with Intel for working on this, for instance, they will have credential to access this service. And they can just you know, push when they want, when they add some software source code tables to the software heritage archive. In, in tech terms, it is an implementation of a protocol which is called SWORD, which is a protocol used by digital libraries to exchange uh, articles or data set that has been deposited by a researcher uh, on those services, but we have reused it for uh, depositing source code. And it has a RESTful API that you can use as to implement your own deposit tools with a, um, a command line wrapper that you can use as a ready-to-use tool. So as an example, imagine you have the software table that Alexius was talking about. Well, you create your table. That's not something we're going to do for you. That's not the part we're going to outsource uh, for you. But you have your table. You have taken care of the fact that the table, it is indeed the complete and corresponding source code table for your project. And what you can do, you add some metadata that are not in the table itself. So you add, for instance, if you have an internal identifier for that release, you can put it in there. You can say the name of the project. You can say the, the person who is responsible. So a bunch of additional information about that, that table. And you have a tool in which you can use that to push it to the software heritage archive. So initially, it will give, give you an answer, which is essentially a receipt. Tell you, OK, we have received our table. And you have a deposit ID, which is number 11. And you can use that receipt monitor the status of the deposit process in the Software Heritage Archive. So why the status? Because we are not just going to keep your table. 
it's not an FTP service, okay? What they're gonna do is that open up that tarball, look at everything that's inside, and integrate it in the rest of the archive. This way, when you go, finding, go back finding your source code, you can see, for instance, where else it has been used and see it in context of all the rest of the source code we have in the archive. So using that receipt number, you can check what is the status, and at some point, well, ideally for small tarballs, it will take just a few, uh, a few minutes, can be more for very large tarballs. At some point, it will tell you done, this is done, and it will give you an ID, which is a persistent identifier of the kind of object that has been created. So this number here is the persistent identifier that we guarantee it will always work and will be around for, uh, for reaccessing your, uh, your stuff later. So with that, with that identifier, you can reference stuff that has been in our archive. You have a URL where you can point your users, and you can navigate the thing in the archive. So for instance, even if I should never do demos, we are opening up the browsing interface to the archive for FOSDEM, so you can go to archive.softwareheritage.org, password is 2018, and navigate the entire archive. And here, it's what you will see if you deposit a tarball, where you can navigate into a GitHub interface, and if it were something more, a more complex object, like a Git dump, for instance, you can see the revision history and that kind of stuff. Also, you can, of course, download it, because that's the point. You want to point your users to our archive to retrieve the source code. So there is a service, which is called the Software Heritage Vault, when you carry a request to download stuff. That, too, is an asynchronous service, because, for very, because we deduplicate everything. So for very large objects, it can take a while to collect all the files that you want to download. But again, you have an API. No fancy wrapper yet. It's still a bit rough around the corner. But you have an API to request the download of the object. You can request a notification from when the object is ready, and when it is, you go there, you retrieve your object, and you, can, you have back your table. So to sum up, uh, long-term hosting of completely corresponding source code might be onerous for, for large corporations. That is what I learned from, from my lectures and from many other uh, open source people in big companies in the interim. And it is OK for copy the flight senses to outsource the, the responsibility of hosting that tarball to a third party site, provided you have some agreement and provided you make sure that stuff remains there. Software heritage is meant to keep software available in, very long, in, the, in the very long term. So we are doing crawling. So if you, what, we want, what you want to offer is already part of the archive, that's fine. You just find the object in the archive, and you can point your user to it. If you have more stuff, which you usually do because you have patched source code, you have additional source code, well, you can now push it to the archive and retrieve it later and point your users to software heritage to find your source code. It's still a prototype. It's still something a bit rough around the edges. For instance, we do not support yet the use cases of doing partial deposit in which you point to stuff that is already in archive without having to upload again a giant GCC tarball. But that's in, in the working and something we plan to, we, we plan to support in the, uh, in the following. All the tooling is uh, free and open source software because that's, that's what we do. So if you're interested in uh, uh, being part of this experiment you're doing, you're more than welcome to come and talk to us uh, after the talk. Thanks. Rings a bell, yeah. Answer for software heritage in that. Yeah, yeah. So the, we, what we want to do is preserve source code which is available, which might be already free software today. It might be not. We want to preserve it anyway because it will become free software one day, for instance, when copyright expires. So, of course, we expect that the use case, like there was Intel, it will be free software all the way through. But the only thing we are doing is adding some automatic detection of metadata, like we run some license scanners, for instance, and we have an API to fetch those metadata. But for now, we don't have human curation of that data, something that can be added 
on top of software heritage, but it's not part of the archival part and of this use case. Yet. So in this case, the filtering, oh, sorry. The question is, do you worry about people uploading stuff to the archive that we do not want to store? So in this case, the, uh, the, the responsibility of checking they do not push crazy stuff and, or wires or whatever, it's on their side. And, but that's why we are only working with selected partner for this kind of stuff. Another example is uh, collaboration with uh, open access um, archives for papers, for scientific papers. That ca those, that in those cases, we have the researcher adding software to paper, and they can push it to us. But that, too, is essentially their responsibility. Uh, so we, so the question is, can we go and search? Thanks. Can we go and search and find all this stuff that has been deposited by Intel? Yes. So we, the reason why there is an extra metadata and the reason why it is stored as a commit rather just than just as a tarball is that so can we have a place where easily add all the metadata and those metadata will be searchable. Today they are not yet. So if you go to archivesoftwareheritage.org with the credential I've given, you can search, but you can search on only on other stuff like uh, uh, the the name of the repository. But we will open up metadata. So, again, uh, we're talking about the software that, oh, sorry, yeah. uh, repeat the question, right. So, are we, are we not afraid that people will learn what we're using, basically, right. Uh, again, think of it, this is, this is the fulfillment service of the thing that we already provide. There is nothing more secret than, you know, whoever uh, gets it can, could already get it before, right, and we don't have Karsten. So for us, it's just uh, <laughs> it's to upload essentially incomplete stuff with references to stuff in the software heritage archive. Is that just um, a convenient step? But I will allow, I will offer for download the entire thing. Okay. So if you have found something in the software heritage archive, it means it's already there. And when I recreate the tarball or the Git repo or whatever, I will do the merge of the things together. Uh, GCC version and he will make sh uh, he will understand that hey I have already that on my archive we will not be searching to see if he already has in order to upload the patches for example right it's because the, the duplicate of the I imagine for instance next releases of the same product if you want to avoid re-uploading dependence you could that's really up to you so that's a feature that's available and then whether you're using it or not it's up to So the question is, full GitHub backup? Yes, we do. And uh, well, it's so it's crawling and it's a schedule, so it might be lagging, but that's that's part of our current coverage. And not only that, if you look at the, uh, there is a documentation page on GitHub mentioning archival projects, and they point to us as a, they don't call us as a backup, but <laughs> we we work on archiving that stuff, of the public part, of course. <laughs> The question is, do, do, do we see commercial uh, partnership like this as a way of making the project sustainable? So I should thank here Intel, they are a sponsor of the project. And yes, of course, this is part of it. But right now, it's, it's more like developing the foundation so that we can offer this kind of uh, opportunities to other partners. Pam? Uh, sorry.
So what I said is that we have no guarantee right now that what we archive is today for software. But the, 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 the approach we use is that once we go to places that are meant to host uh, free software. So GitHub is meant to host. Of course, people push to GitHub also stuff which is not free today, or maybe binaries. So in addition to that first, let's say, curation step, what we do is that we use automatic tools to detect licenses, okay? And we expose that information. So that the information is available. We do not actively delete stuff. But if someone wants to, you know, discriminate what is free today and what is not, they can rely on those metadata to, to, to make the decision. You're not, you're not making any effort to collect this, right? This is really oh, no, no. No, not at all. It's, yeah, correct. So someone said it's incidental. Yes. Uh, have we considered partnering with other archival organizations? Yes, and we have. So, for instance, the, uh, the archive of Gitorios that year we have retrieved, that's been thanks to collaboration with the Internet Archive. Uh, the Google Code thing has been thanks to collaboration with Google. And we are kind of complementary because the Internet Archive stops at the boundaries of source code, basically. So it, they will not uh, crawl version control systems. They will not open up tarballs and index inside them. And we, work, and we are not doing the archival of the web part. So in the ideal world, we have persistent identifiers for the stuff they archive, for the stuff we archive, and some external service like Wikipedia or a new Wikipedia of software in the future can make the link between all the things that have been archived. Last question. So the question is, is it correct to say that we are going toward an escrow service? So right now, no, because everything we archive is not like embargoed or anything. Yeah. But, uh, but potentially, you can imagine, you, yes, you can imagine doing that. Great, let's thank ZMZ. Thanks. ZMZ, yeah. Be the man. Exactly. That is, that is the coolest project that I get. I, lo yes. I love it. I'm like, why should everyone do this? Everyone yeah, should do this. Everyone, that's everyone, that's everyone that's should do, do this. This, this, is this, is this, is this, this is like the best way of like doing CCS and showing that you've got good clients. And you've got like the deposit ticket and the yeah. SHA. It's like, I love it. I love, love, love it. Good.